Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Rachel Koo, and this beautiful northern city is now my new home. But I, along with most Swedes, often escape to the tranquility of a little cabin in the countryside. Look at that! It's huge! Bit of a mouthful, that, isn't it? My Wallenberger burgers. Two waffles ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a pea soup without the mustard. A cake worthy of a celebration, I think. Cheers! Yay! Exploring Sweden and all the culinary delights it has to offer will be the source of inspiration in my Swedish kitchen. The region of Småland in the southeast of Sweden is filled with woods and lakes. This was a poor area inhabited by hardy people, loggers, fishermen and farmers. During the large immigration to America in the 19th and 20th century, over 20% of all Swedes left for the United States, many of them from this region. In the middle of Småland, I'm meeting Magnus Neiman, who is taking me crayfishing in the same lake his father and grandfather caught these delicious lobster-like creatures. When did you start crayfishing? How old were you? Actually, I've been doing this really, really long time. My grandfather, he had this small farm. Uh-huh. And then they planted crayfish. Oh, wow. Really. So I've been crayfishing since I was really, really little. Yeah, I think we've got enough fish now to bait, don't we? We have, yes. Yeah. Certainly. Right. OK, this is the cage. Yeah, so the little yellow boxes... Yes. ..is what we're going to fill with the fish. Like one? That's enough. Half a fish Half will a do fish. it. Right, let's do some crayfishing. Of course. <laughs> Eating crayfish is something the Swedes have in common with people from Louisiana in the United States, but not with the rest of Scandinavia. We have put bait in the crayfish cages and will place them in the shallow part. Well, I prepared this one oh, for you. Oh, thank you very much. The cages are left in the water overnight before being pulled up. Luckily, Magnus put them out the day oh, before. Oh, wow! Quite a lot. Yeah, loads. Look Fantastic. at that. Wow, that one's huge. Do you see this one here? Yeah, that's was a good one. A bit angry. It is very angry. I don't want to get my fingers in between those claws. <laughs> I think we've done pretty well. I think so too. In Sweden, crayfish are boiled in dill and eaten cold. Everyone has their own special recipe. We're heading back to an inn that Magnus manages, where he will show me his recipe. OK, Magnus, we're going to cook some crayfish. Yes. How are we going to cook them? We have this crown dill, we okay. have the uh, dark beer, we have some sugar and we have this salt. And we will make this magic so it will turn them into red. Right, well, let's get cracking. Yeah. Traditionally, crayfish are cooked for a couple of minutes until they turn red and then removed. The brine is cooled before the crayfish is added back to the brine and left overnight to soak up more of the flavour. Let's go have a taste. Fantastic. I was taught you have to eat it like this. Yes, it's important. That's where you taste all the delicious yes. dill and yeah. the beer from the brine. School and tack så mycket. Tack för hjälpen. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Mmm, you have to have beer with crayfish. I think so. Yeah, and a little glass of schnapps sometimes. If you like singing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Crayfish are part and parcel of the Swedish year, August and September being the time you fish them. One of the best ways to eat them is in the form of a soup. I've got some pre-cooked crayfish here and I'm going to shell them. Langoustine or even large prawns can be substituted for the crayfish. I'm going to keep the claws whole because they'll look really beautiful for the decoration. It's really the tail which is the meaty part. Don't discard the shells, we're going to use them for the stock. The majority of the flavour is in the shell. 
I think my favorite Swedish celebration has to be a crayfish party. Going out, fishing for the crayfish, and then cooking them. And then the fun bit is obviously eating them with friends and family, singing, drinking schnapps. Crayfish is all peeled. And now I'm just gonna make my base for the soup. I need one carrot. Finely chop your carrot. Stick of celery, same procedure. And finally, an onion. I'm gonna get my pot nice and hot. A little bit of oil in there. Your carrots, your celery, and your onion. Give it a little stir. You're just softening the onions at this point, no caramelization. Pinch of cayenne pepper and paprika. Tomato paste. You're basically frying this until the onion's soft. I'm gonna add some white wine. And then I'm gonna add the shells. They've got all of that lovely crayfish flavor in there. Give that a good stir. Some hot fish stock. A Little bit of white pepper. A couple of bay leaves. All you need to do at this point is let it simmer for about half an hour so the stock reduces and intensifies in flavour. Leave it uncovered. So, as you can see, the stock has simmered down, it's reduced, the flavours have intensified, and we've got this amazing bright red colour. I'm going to remove the shells and all the little bits in the soup. Now you want to put the soup back into the pot. And then I'm just draining the last bit of the stock away. Some double cream. Save a little bit for the garnish. A touch of salt. All that's left to do is stir in the bits of crayfish meat and prep your garnish. A few chives. Time to serve. Don't forget the crayfish claws. A sprinkle of chives. Before I forget, a splash of cream. That's all you need for your crayfish party. Vestervotten cheese has to be my favourite Swedish cheese. It's hearty, packed with flavour, great to eat on its own, perfect in a pie. I'm going to make my pastry for the pie. Need some plain flour, pinch of salt, a tablespoon of mustard. It's not what you normally put in pastry, but this gives it an extra flavour. Cold butter. And now you just want to rub the butter and flour through your fingers to make a sandy texture. This is why it's super important to have cold butter. The butter's slightly warm, it'll start to melt. When you have that crumbly texture, I'm gonna add some vodka. What that does is not add an alcoholic flavor, but actually keep the pastry flaky. Vodka will help bring the dough together without developing the gluten, unlike water, as the alcohol evaporates during the baking process. I'm gonna roll out my pastry between two sheets of baking paper. It's better to do it this way than flouring your work surface, flouring your dough and rolling it out in flour. That way you minimize the amount of additional flour you add to your dough. Also, it's super easy just to move your dough around. The pastry should be rolled out so it's larger than your pie tin. Now, once you've rolled out your pastry to the right size, it's gonna go in the fridge for 30 minutes. So my pastry is chilled for half an hour. I'm going to put it in my tin. Make sure you tuck right into the edges there. Push it down a little bit. Then I'm going to take the rolling pin, 
Just run the rolling pin around the tin. Brick the base. This stops air bubbles forming in the pastry base. And then put in some baking paper, important part. And I'm going to use some dried chickpeas as baking weights. Bake at 160 degrees fan for 20 minutes before removing the baking weights. And bake for a further 10 minutes or until the base is firm and dry. I'm going to make my filling for the cheese pie. And for that you need lots of cheese. Best of bottom cheese. You can use mature cheddar, comte or any other flavour packed hard cheese. Cream. And then three eggs. Generous pinch of salt. Lots of black pepper. Mix that all together. I'm going to add an onion. Not what you normally do, but it's a nice addition. Just need to get my pie crust out of the oven. Pour in your egg mixture. Top the pie with the onions. And then that goes in a preheated oven at 180 degrees for 25 to 30 minutes. To my Vesterbottom pie, I'm going to do a chanterelle topping. Once the butter is sizzling away, you can add your mushrooms. We chop the parsley. Add a pinch of salt to your mushrooms. Vesterbottom pie usually makes appearances at midsummer, crayfish parties, Christmas, but I actually really like having a slice with some fresh green salad. Don't need to serve it for special occasions. So the easiest way to remove the ring off the pie is to put it on something high and then you can just slide it off like that. Let's slide this onto my plate. Pile your chanterelle on top. Sprinkle on the pasty. I think Vesterbotten pie has to be one of my favourite Swedish dishes. And I'm sure it will be yours too. Just try and make it. I'm on my way to the Costa Border Glass Factory. Glass has been blown in these parts since the 16th century. The dense forest provided perfect fuel for the glass blowing fires. The workers used to live at the factories and after a hard day's work, they got together and used the ovens that were still hot to cook their dinners. But before I get to taste some traditional glass factory food, I will try to blow some glass. Wow, look at that. Nicholas Frode is a master glass blower and will be my teacher. In the bucket there, you grab one of those blocks. Yeah. Shape the glass. Okay. Yeah. And then you put the, the block back yeah. and add a little bit of water on the newspaper. Swedish newspaper. And you yeah. put it in your hand like that. And yeah, you shape the glass. Oh, wow. With your hand without getting burned. That's amazing. Of course, it has to be Swedish newspaper. Absolutely. <laughs> you will blow and yeah. turn, turn at the same time. time. So, yeah. Right. The more you blow, the thinner it gets. So, it will also cool down quicker. Woo! Takes a little bit of practicing. And yeah, but how long have you been blowing glass? For about 30 years. Yeah. So. But what's really interesting about this region of Sweden, Småland, there's a long history of making glasses. Yeah, well, the reason why they put the glass factories here is because they, they use uh, the wood for um, firing up the furnaces and you had the, the lakes with the sand, the sand mm -hmm. for making the, the raw material through the glass. And it's being really resourceful, mm. which I heard you're also very resourceful with the way you use the heat from the furnaces afterwards to cook food. Exactly, yeah. Well, I think we should go try the food. We should do that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that. The tradition of cooking together at the end of a hard day glass blowing lives on even today. The word for it, hutsil, means cabin herring. So we've got baked potatoes, yeah. some bacon, and then, ah, what's this? This is isterbund, like pork sausages. 
So this is a, a local sausage, which is very much from the Smallland region. Yeah. It, it's starting to look like an English breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Just need my fried egg on the side. The <laughs> <laughs> What's this? This is the herring. OK. Yeah. So it's got herring, onions... Cream, I guess. Cream, yeah. yeah, and some dill. Goes well with the potato. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to try some of the herring. Mm. Mm. It's yeah. nice and salty. It's nice and mm. salty. Now for some of this local sausage. It smells delicious, really smoky um, flavours. Mmm. That's delicious. It is. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, look, we should have a little score. A little score, yeah. yeah. That's... It's good. It's good. Sorry, I can't down it. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the real Swedish, like, yeah. down it in one. Not hard enough. <laughs> After standing up for the main food, we sat down for dessert. Smallland is known for its cheesecake, which is light and fluffy and served with jam. So Oskarke is something I hadn't heard of before I'd moved to Sweden. OK, It's yeah. something which doesn't really travel beyond Sweden. Uh, Ost is cheese and Kaka is cake, mm -hmm. so, so it's it should be a cheesecake. Cheesecake. But... And it's warm. It is warm as well. So mm. that's, makes it even a little bit more tastier. Feels you like, like it? Yeah, I love it. Mm. It feels like this is a real grandma dessert. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Nicholas, for letting me come blow some glass and eat some delicious food. The cheesecake is nothing like the traditional cheesecake. It has a distinct taste that is uniquely Scandinavian. I cannot wait to try my own version of this Swedish classic. Oskarka, Swedish cheesecake from Småland. It's rich and creamy with a slight semolina texture and an almond aroma. Definitely worth trying. I'm gonna make a fresh cheese base, which is very simple, some flour. And then you want to whisk in a little bit of milk to make a paste. Now, it's important to put the flour in first and slowly stir in the milk, otherwise you'll get lumps. Make a sort of wallpaper paste, and then you can whisk in the rest of the milk. And then I'm going to add some rennet. Now, rennet is something you can usually find at the chemist or some specialised grocery stores. And basically what rennet does is make the milk separate into whey and curds. Whey is the liquid remaining when you curd all your milk. Curd are the milk solids which are strained to make the cheesecake. You want to gently stir the mixture and raise the temperature to about 37 degrees. 37 degrees Celsius is warm enough that you can put your finger in without burning yourself. So, the mixture has separated into whey and curds. I'm going to let that sit for half an hour to cool down before I drain it off. So my whey and curds, they've separated nicely and I've lined a bowl with a clean tea towel. I'm going to pour this in. Gather up the ends and give it a bit of a squeeze. You want to remove as much liquid as possible. And then I'm going to use the wooden spoon to wrap the ends around and you just want to let that drip for about an hour means the curd becomes nice and firm. So you can see we've just got the curd left and it's dried nicely. A tablespoon of sugar. A pinch of salt ground almonds, and then some bitter almonds for the almond aroma. If you can't get hold of bitter almonds, you could use almond essence. You don't need to use too much. It shouldn't be overpowering. 
Now to bring the mix together, I'm going to add an egg, single cream, and then you just mix it all together. All you need to do is spoon it into your ramekins now. Preheated oven at 175 degrees fan for roughly 15 to 20 minutes. You know when the oskaka is done because it's slightly golden on the top and it looks set. The traditional way to eat oskaka is with a good dollop of whipped cream and some cloudberry jam. Or you could have raspberry jam or whatever jam you fancy. It's hard to resist them when they're warm. Mmm, couldn't think of a sweeter way of finishing a meal. My trip through Sweden is over for now. I've met the most wonderful people and learned so much about the Swedish history and culture. My knowledge of Swedish food and what makes Scandinavian cuisine so special is vastly greater than when I started on my journey. I've come to appreciate the simplicity of the food and the clean and crisp flavours. A way of cooking I will keep with me for the rest of my life. <laughs>